Hello, my name is Roy McMasters. I have the privilege of introducing you to the construction division of American Environmental Group. We are an industry leader and pride ourselves on our commitment to the safety of our employees and the safety culture we have been able to create. Our number one priority has always been to strive for excellence. At AEG, we only do things the right way, which means working as safe as we possibly can every day. We want to make sure you are prepared when you are on the job, so we have created this safety video to give you the basic knowledge and assistance you may need to do your job properly and safely. At AEG, you are part of a team, so remember your actions affect the entire team. For your safety and your team's safety, it is very important that you always comply with the safety rules. Please pay close attention to this video and make sure safety procedures become part of your everyday work routine. Do not hesitate to ask your supervisor any questions you may have after reviewing this safety video. AEGL Professional Excellence, Dedication, and Experience. Established in Richfield, Ohio in 2002, American Environmental Group Limited, or AEGL, is the leading solid waste construction industry in the United States. With approximately 500 employees and operations throughout the country, AEGL provides specialty environmental, construction, and maintenance services to solid and hazardous waste, environmental, energy, mining, and other industrial clients. We pride ourselves on safety, providing the highest quality service with an emphasis on meeting and exceeding the expectations of our clients. But the success of AEGL is dependent on the strength of its team. Each employee plays a vital role towards the company's success. Through a true open door policy, employees can freely meet with any member of management to discuss concerns and questions regarding any aspect of a work situation. AEGL encourages strong and open communication within all phases of its operation. Safety is a core value in all business operations of AEGL. It is our policy to operate worldwide in a safe and responsible manner a manner which respects the health and safety of our employees, our customers, and the communities where we work. AEGL is required by law to follow many safety practices and regulations, such as those established by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, commonly known as OSHA, and the Mine Safety and Health Administration, or MSHA. More importantly, we recognize that our employees are our greatest asset, and we intend to do all that we can to protect our workers. As such, we have established safety rules, procedures, and practices to address recognized hazards and provide the safest work environment possible. However, the only way that any safety plan can be made successful is by adhering to it. Ignoring or deviating from company safety requirements puts everyone at extreme risk and therefore cannot be tolerated. Your responsibilities and our safety program are easy to perform. As an AEGL employee, you are required to comply with all safety regulations of the job site. Recognize that you are the person most responsible for your own safety. The individual actions you take and the decisions you make will be the most important factors in ensuring your personal safety. Understand all safety instructions that you receive. 
If you are not sure what is expected of you, ask your supervisor before undertaking any activity. Comply with all safety regulations of the job site. Participate in your safety program and be actively involved in safety meetings, tailgate meetings, and other safety activities. Listen and ask questions about anything that is not clear to you. Look for unsafe conditions and acts before they cause an accident. Either solve the problem yourself or tell your supervisor. And report all job injuries, illnesses, and even near misses immediately to your supervisor. Even if you don't think it was serious or maybe a little embarrassing to admit, let your supervisor know what happened. He or she can decide on the best course of action. A safe work environment is everyone's responsibility. Failure to adhere to safety procedures and policies will subject any individual employed at AEGL to disciplinary action and could result in dismissal. If you are a new employee of AEGL, it is especially important to understand how to work safely and make these safe practices a habit in both on and off the job activities. It's also good practice to be up to date with OSHA safety guidelines for specific job sites, such as Haswopper, landfills, gold mines, and power plants. Always keep these thoughts front of mind when working at any job site. Your health could depend on it. If you know it isn't safe, don't do it. If it doesn't look safe, it probably isn't. Therefore, you must stop and reevaluate the task. Get help from your supervisor or others if necessary. The health and safety officers are responsible for the overall implementation of the health and safety program for the company, but they are not responsible for your safety. You are. Their duties include assisting field supervisors and others in implementing and managing the health and safety program. They are also responsible for reviewing safety procedures and conducting field audits to ensure that we are performing our work as safely as possible. The site superintendent is the person who is responsible for implementing site health and safety requirements in the field. Specific duties of the site superintendent include perform and document a safety orientation for all AEGL site personnel that will serve to familiarize all personnel with the procedures, requirements, and provisions of the health and safety plan. Provide for the safety of any visitors who enter the site. Order the immediate shutdown of site activities in the case of a medical emergency, unsafe conditions, or unsafe practice. Provide and enforce the use of safety equipment, personal protective equipment, or PPE, and other items necessary for AEGL employees. Conduct job site inspections as a part of quality assurance for safety and health. And report safety and health concerns to management as necessary. While AEGL has very qualified superintendents and foremen who keep a close watch on safety with our projects, AEGL knows that to be as successful as possible, each and every worker must be looking out for safety as well. All employees of AEGL are responsible for their own safety, along with the safety of those around them. In addition, the use of any equipment must be performed in a safe and responsible manner, as directed by their supervisor. Every employee has the right and the obligation to personally stop or report any unsafe practice, work condition, or safety violation they observe. An unsafe work condition can also be caused by illness. Be vigilant in your watch for any ill effects experienced by crew members, especially those symptoms caused by heat stress or chemical exposure. Don't be afraid to approach or stop a coworker from doing something unsafe you may actually be preventing an injury. If the employee wishes to make a report, they may do so by speaking to their immediate supervisor or to a member of higher management. The employee may also submit his or her concerns in writing, either signed or anonymously. HASPs are written documents that discuss the anticipated health and safety hazards at the project in which you are working. 
Their purpose is to define and communicate the company's health and safety plan that is designed to assure a safe working environment for its employees, guests, and the community at large. The function of this site-specific health and safety plan, or HASP, is to identify the health and safety hazards of each phase of site operation, identify the procedures to be implemented to ensure employee protection, identify the PPE requirements for the project, be available to any client or owner, contractor or subcontractor, or representatives who will be involved with site operations. It must also be accessible to employees, OSHA personnel, and federal, state, or local agencies with regulatory authority over the site. Clearly define all safety procedures. In the event of conflicting safety procedures or requirements, AEGL personnel must implement those safety practices which afford the highest level of protection. Describe steps to be taken in the event of a site emergency, such as an injury or fire. While the HASP is prepared to address all of the known hazards at the site, often issues come up that were not anticipated. If you come across a health or safety issue during your work at a site that was not discussed in the HASP, bring it to the attention of your supervisor. Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDS, are documents that describe the chemical and physical hazards of chemicals at our projects. Examples of hazardous chemicals are lubricants for equipment, glues or adhesives for assembling pipes, and gasoline for fueling vehicles. MSDS documents are prepared by the chemical manufacturers and are usually shipped to AEGL with the products we buy. The site supervisor must ensure that an MSDS is available at the project site for each hazardous chemical listed on the project chemical inventory. He must also make certain that the subcontractors are aware of the MSDS location and have access to this information while performing work on AEGL project sites. While MSDS come in a wide variety of formats and lengths, they all will discuss, at minimum, the following important issues related to safety when using specific chemicals. The chemical name and ingredients of the product. Physical and chemical characteristics, such as, is the product lighter or heavier than air, or is it flammable? The routes of entry into the body and how the chemical can affect you. Safe handling or use of the chemical. How to prevent a fire involving the product. What to do in an emergency if the product is accidentally inhaled or contacts your skin. The MSDS for each project will be in a binder at the project site, usually with the supervisor, a designated company vehicle, or the job trailer. It is very important to know the exact location of the MSDS book, so check with your supervisor if you are not sure. Always take the time to read the MSDS for the chemicals you use or are not familiar with. Know the hazards of the chemicals on site and the steps you can take to protect yourself and others before problems occur. The MSDS is a major component of AEGL's hazard communication program. Other parts include chemical inventory, proper container labeling, maintenance of the MSDS, and employee training. Most of these program subjects will be addressed on a project-specific basis. Site supervisors play a critical role in ensuring the dynamic elements of this program are implemented on each project site. The site supervisor must compile a written list of hazardous chemicals present on the project site to which employees may be exposed. This list must be kept current and in the project MSDS binder. Site supervisors also are highly involved in container labeling. They must ensure that all chemicals present on a project site are contained in the original container and have readable manufacturer labels and warnings. The labels must be displayed on the container, kept clean and legible, and written in English. In the future, changes will be occurring within hazardous communications OSHA is in the process of aligning OSHA's hazard communication standard with the globally harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, or the GHS. 
The GHS is a system for standardizing and harmonizing the classification and labeling of chemicals. As of June 1, 2015, all labels will be required to have pictograms, a signal word, hazard and precautionary statements, the product identifier, and supplier identification. Changes will also take place with the Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDS. They will now be provided in a uniform format, with associated information listed under specific numbers and headings. The basic goal of these changes is to ensure that employers, employees, and the public are provided with adequate, practical, reliable, and comprehensible information on the hazards of chemicals so they can take effective measures for their health and safety. We will now discuss personal protective equipment, or PPE. These are items that you must wear for protection from harm to your body. They are worn to raise your visibility on the job site, prevent objects from entering or striking your body, and lessen impact in the event of being struck. The use of PPE can save you from injury or illness and possibly save your life, but PPE can only help if you wear it. The following is the minimum PPE required on all AEGL job sites. Safety glasses, goggles, or a face shield. Tinted ANSI approved sunglasses or shields can be used during the day. However, they must be clear when working at night. This means no tint. A hard hat. High visible, reflective green vest, a high visible t-shirt, or both. Work gloves should be with you at all times and on your hands when working. Kevlar cut gloves are required when working with a razor knife. A leather type steel toe boot that meets recognized ANSI industrial standards. The work boots must also cover your ankles. This is a minimum level of PPE that must be worn at any AEGL project site. Other higher levels of PPE may be required depending on the task and the job site specifics. If you don't know what PPE to wear or aren't sure, check with your supervisor or the HASP. It is your responsibility to know what PPE requirements apply to your job and to wear the proper PPE for your work. Air monitoring instruments are also used at our projects as another means of protecting our workers. While it is not common, there is the potential for airborne chemicals or similar hazards to exist at some of our project sites depending upon the tasks being performed and the specific area. The most common air monitor we use is a four gas meter. This instrument measures four different potential hazards in the air. The level of oxygen, the amount of flammables, the level of carbon monoxide, and the level of hydrogen sulfide. Once the monitor is calibrated, it will alarm if any one of these hazards is present at an unacceptable level and therefore warns you of the hazard before you work in the area. Air monitoring instruments are very important for your safety when used at our project sites. Be sure that you understand completely how the air monitor works and always follow the recommendations made from the monitoring results. It could very well save your life. This is a chart that describes the readings of the four gas meter with related action levels and the corrective actions that must be taken when these levels are determined unsafe. If there are any questions with the readings, always evacuate the area until your questions are addressed and resolved. The following gas level readings require that you either evacuate the area, ventilate the area, or both. Again, if there are any questions in your mind about the readings, always err on the side of caution. That means evacuate. For O2 or oxygen, the action level is required for a reading less than 19.5%. For the amount of gas or vapor in the air capable of producing a flash fire in the presence of an ignition source, better known as LEL, a percentage greater than 10% demands protective measures. For CO, or carbon monoxide, the action level is required for
for a percentage greater than 35 parts per million or ppm. And for H2S or hydrogen sulfide, a reading greater than 10 parts per million requires that action be taken. If you are unsure on how to operate or read the four gas meter, be sure to talk with your supervisor. Any employee whose work has them outside an area that is not protected by permanent or temporary guardrails or on any other surface, such as structural steel, steps, or landings, where they are subject to fall greater than six feet, must be protected by a personal fall protection system. The three types of personal fall protection systems are personal fall arrest, positioning devices, and personal restraint systems. At times, AEGL performs work from elevated platforms where fall hazards exist. This work typically requires a personal fall arrest system for fall protection. A personal fall arrest system is used to stop an employee's fall from an elevated working level. The system consists of an anchorage, connectors, full body harness, and a lanyard with a deceleration device. Self-retracting lifelines or a vertical lifeline with a rope grab can be used in lieu of the six foot lanyard with a deceleration device. Anchor points used in a personal fall arrest system should be secured at or above the level of the back D-ring on the harness. This action will ensure that the free fall distance is limited. The anchor point must be a structural member capable of supporting a minimum weight of 5,000 pounds per employee. The supervisor must ensure that all personnel using a personal fall arrest system are properly trained. For all AEG drilling operations, there are special fall protection guidelines that have been set in place. To begin, these requirements specify that a 20 to 25 foot barrier must be set up around the borehole before any drilling starts. This barrier can be made up of caution tape or fencing when available. Before any drilling activity begins, you are required to be in a fall protection harness and this harness must have the safety line connected to an anchor before you are allowed to cross the barrier. In addition, the safety line must be set to allow you no closer than within two feet of the borehole. If you are new to drilling operations or have any questions, your supervisor will walk you through the procedure when you are on site. It is essential to the safety of everyone that every piece of fall protection equipment be inspected and maintained on a regular basis. Each personal fall protection systems component must be inspected prior to use. Check for wear, tears, mold, mildew, or distortion. Ensure that no straps are cut, torn, or scraped. Check for worn stitching. Inspect hardware for cracks, sharp edges, or burrs. Ensure that snap hooks close and lock tightly. Check for distorted hooks or faulty hook springs and that all buckles work properly. Defective equipment must be identified, tagged out, and replaced. Equipment that has been subject to impact loading must be disposed of and not used again. All employees who might be exposed to fall hazards must be trained. The training must enable each employee to recognize the hazards of falling and the practices to be used to minimize these hazards. There are many things you can do on your own to make your workday safer. By dressing and behaving in a safe, responsible manner on a daily basis, safety will become a habit. While using proper PPE can greatly reduce your chances of being injured, your general dress plays a big part as well. Never dress in worn, torn, or compromised clothing. Make sure that your clothes are of a comfortable fit, not too loose or too tight. Shirts must have sleeves that extend at least four inches down the arm. Keep pockets fastened when using equipment where debris or sparks may come in contact. Never wear any type of jewelry while working. Your conduct and behavior are also vital to the crew's safety. Never engage in activity that can cause unnecessary distractions to others. 
horseplay of any kind will not be tolerated and is grounds for dismissal. Personal behaviors and activities must also be kept in check as well. Using headphones to listen to music or broadcasts at the work site is not allowed. The use of personal cell phones while working is also prohibited. Again, making good safety practices as part of your everyday routine will get you in the habit of being safe. And it gets others thinking about their safety preparation as well. A site-specific orientation is an OSHA requirement and must be conducted by the site superintendent prior to your initial entering of the job site. The site safety orientation must also be documented and signed by all employees attending. In most cases, the client, owner, or contractor will require all AEGL employees working on site to attend a separate site safety orientation. The briefing is usually conducted by the site safety officer. During the initial AEGL pre-job site-specific training session, employees will be instructed on the following topics. Content and implementation of the HASP. Site hazards and controls. Intended use of the personal protective equipment. And emergency information, including local emergency response team phone numbers, route to the nearest hospital, evacuation, and emergency response procedures. A dry run to the hospital would be good practice in case of a medical emergency. It is your responsibility to be aware of all potential hazards and related safety regulations when working on a new job site. Remember, someone who doesn't work is required, meaning the safest way possible puts everyone on the workforce at risk. Always think about the person next to you. Toolbox meetings are brief gatherings of crew members along with their supervisor. They are also known as the JSA or Job Safety Analysis Meetings. These meetings are held early in the morning before the crew begins their workday. This is done prior to any work so the crew members can be reminded of hazards inherent to the work at hand and take precautions for avoiding them. Toolbox meetings are used most successfully to inform employees of worksite hazards, assist with safe procedure reviews, and help develop employee awareness. Hazard awareness is a major factor in injury prevention. Often, exercise with stretching is conducted to get muscles and mind warmed up for the work ahead. The following are the primary steps of the JSA safety meetings. On the front page, or step one, your foreman or supervisor will identify all the items that pertain to your work activities that day. These items will be reviewed with the crew. On the back page, or step two, all the work activities planned for that day will be listed under sequence of job steps. These are short descriptions of what types of work you will be performing. Examples would be fusing 18 inch pipe, trenching, and placing HDPE pipe. Next, the amount of risk involved is identified in each task that is listed in the potential risk section. Examples of risk include, but are not limited to, tripping over extension cords or hands or fingers caught in the fusion equipment. For trenching and placing HDPE pipe, risk includes high H2S, carbon monoxide or methane, trench collapse, and falls into trench. The last step is reviewing and enacting preventive measures to eliminate the risk of injury or reduce it. For example, preventive measures for tripping over extension cords include, keep extension cords out from around your feet. For hands or fingers getting caught in fusing equipment, the preventive measures would be, wear work gloves. Do not put your hands in pinch points on the equipment. Communicate clearly, pay attention, and ensure pipe is secured and will not roll. Examples of preventive measures for high H2S, CO, or methane would include 
ensure gas meters are calibrated and working correctly, gas meter required when entering the trench, and if gas meter alarms, leave the trench. For trench collapse and falling into trench, the measures would include ensure that ladders are placed within 25 feet of all personnel in the trench, ensure proper benching and sloping, ensure that spoil piles are two feet from the edge of the trench, and place barricade around trench. Once all the hazards have been identified and preventive measures have been set, the final step is to follow the safety procedures talked about and then sign the form. Take these meetings seriously by listening, asking questions, contributing your know-how for the less experienced coworkers, and following the advice discussed in the meeting. Many physical hazards can be present during the use of hand and power tools. The greatest amount of injuries associated with hand tools arise from improper maintenance, misuse, and lack of proper PPE. The three essential elements of hand tool safety are tool selection, safe work practices, and maintenance. The following safe work practices must be used when using hand and power tools. Retractable razor knife. Use proper PPE, such as Kevlar gloves and eye protection at all times when using a retractable razor knife. Always use the proper cutting technique, which is to be cutting away from your body parts whenever possible. Be aware of your surroundings. Don't cut over or around a finished liner as you may damage the liner. Never carry your retractable knife in your pocket. Use a pouch or case to prevent punctures to your body parts. Change your blades frequently. Never wait until it is dull. Always use the correct blade for the material that you are cutting. As a point of note, pocket knives are not allowed at an AEGL worksite. Know what is going on around you at all times. Watch out for coworkers and keep a safe zone around you when cutting. And again, always remember that you should never use a retractable razor knife without wearing Kevlar cut gloves. When swinging a hammer, keep a safety zone that's clear of coworkers. Always use eye protection. Inspect wooden handles to be sure that they are not loose or splintered. Always wear steel toe boots. And keep your body parts out of the direct pathway when using the hammer. When using a handsaw, you should first inspect the handle to ensure it is not cracked or broken. Next, check the blade to ensure it is not bent or dull. Cutting with a dull handsaw can be very dangerous because it requires you to apply much more force than would normally be needed to cut something. Once you begin cutting, make sure the object that you're cutting is secured. And always keep your hands clear of the blade. As with all hand tools, proper eye and hand protection are always required. The following checklist should be followed for safe use of hand saws. Inspect the saw before use and ensure that the handle and blade aren't damaged. Always wear gloves to grip the saw better and protect your hands. Safety glasses must always be worn to protect your eyes. And only use the saw as directed. All power or hand tools must be inspected before every use. Look over the plug and cord and check to see that the plug and prongs are intact and that the cord is not damaged. Make sure that your powered hand tool is plugged into a GFCI to protect you from electrical shock. As always, wear your eye and hand protection. Handheld grinders. Always use proper eye protection, such as safety glasses and a face shield. Make sure that the clothes you are wearing fit properly and are not too loose. Excessively loose clothing could get caught in the rotating disc of the grinder. Never wear jewelry of any kind. Check the power cord and plug for damage. Make sure that the grinding disc is in proper condition, mounted properly, and tightened down. Always use the grinder with its guard on. Never remove or alter the guard in any way. Always use hearing protection. 
To prevent accidental startup, employees should be continually aware of not holding the start button while carrying a tool that is plugged in. Establish a buffer zone from coworkers. When operating the drill, hold it firmly with both hands to prevent the drill from spinning or rotating. Always be certain to inspect the drill bits and attachments as well for excessive wear and tear. Bits that are worn or damaged not only may be hazardous, but they will make your job much more difficult. When drilling out the hole for a branch saddle, special precautions must be taken to prevent you from being struck by the drill. When drilling, there is always the risk of the drill bit becoming pinched or wedged in the material. If you are not prepared for this hazard, the drill could spin and end up striking you. Follow these precautions to avoid this hazard. Always use two hands to hold the drill. Never have your face or any body part close enough to the drill that it could strike you. Be prepared for the possibility of the drill to catch and spin at all times. And, as with all your tools, when you're done with it, be sure to put it away in its proper location. For many project situations, a sawzall is the right tool for the job. The following are safety guidelines that must be recognized when using this particular saw. Wear eye protection at all times when using the reciprocating saw. Keep the electrical cord out of the way of the cut being made. Hold the saw firmly with both hands when making cuts. The saw will vibrate a lot during operation and must be held tightly to keep the cut online and to avoid being dropped during operation. Never operate when in close proximity to other workers. The blade on this saw is unguarded and the vibration movement of the saw makes it especially hazardous to bystanders. Always be certain that the material being cut with the reciprocating saw is properly secured. And do not bind or pinch the blade when making cuts with the reciprocating saw. Binding the blade may cause the blade to break or possibly jerk the saw from the user's hands. Be sure to use the correct type of blade for the material you're cutting. If you're unsure which type of blade to use, ask your supervisor. Remember, the Sawzall is a very useful and effective tool, but the unprotected blade also makes it very dangerous. Always keep safety and situational awareness in mind at all times when using the Sawzall. Chainsaws are used almost daily on AEG construction job sites. They are extremely useful, but can also be very dangerous if not used properly. Remember, the chainsaw will cut through your leg just as fast as it will cut through HDPE pipe. To prevent you from being injured, the following safe work practices need to be followed each and every time that you use a chainsaw. If you have never operated a chainsaw, ask your foreman or supervisor to show you how to operate a chainsaw correctly. Proper PPE is always required. This includes safety glasses or a full face shield and hand protection such as Kevlar gloves. Remember to always inspect the chainsaw before each use. Ensure that the saw is fueled and that the blade is sharp and set at the correct tightness. To properly tighten a chainsaw blade, speak to your foreman or supervisor, even if you think that you know how. This is because different manufacturers require different tightening techniques. Now let's take a look at how to properly start a chainsaw. Knowing how to start a chainsaw properly is extremely important to your safety. In fact, most accidents involving chainsaws are due to poor technique at startup. Remember, you must always take your time when working with a chainsaw, making certain that no harm will come to you or your coworkers. While we all want to get the job at hand done, never cut corners when it comes to safety. Let's begin by inspecting the chainsaw blade. To identify if your chainsaw blade needs tightening, look for a slack in the chain that hangs below the handlebar. Once properly tightened, a chainsaw blade should allow minimal slack and snap back into place on the bar when you pull it down. Remember, we do not normally use bar oil in our chainsaws. This is because the oil would interfere with the welding of the HDPE pipe. 
Before you start the chainsaw, always clear your immediate work area. Then, make sure that the fuel and oil caps are tight. Wipe away any fuel or oil that may have been spilled when added. This is also a good time to perform a visual inspection to check to see if any parts are broken or missing. Also, you should always look to start a chainsaw at a minimum distance of 10 feet away from any fuel source or container. As mentioned earlier, a chainsaw is never to be operated without wearing the proper PPE, such as eye and hand protection. To start a chainsaw, begin by placing the saw on the ground. Make sure the chainsaw is on level ground and check that there are no objects or obstructions nearby that could come in contact with the saw. Then, slip the toe end of your right foot under the rear handle. Next, take your left hand and wrap your hand around the top handle and grasp it firmly, making sure that your elbow is in a locked position. With your right hand, grip the starter handle and pull on the rope. If the saw doesn't start within five tries, alert your supervisor for help. After starting the chainsaw, release the chain brake. Maintain a firm grip on the machine at all times. Keep the chainsaw in front of you and never walk with the chainsaw running. If you need to adjust what you're cutting, always apply the chain break and set the chainsaw down first. Always make sure that you follow these steps entirely and completely when starting a chainsaw. The few minutes that it takes to operate a chainsaw or any piece of equipment properly is nothing compared to the time it takes to recover from an injury. Remember, when working with any power tool, being smart means being safe. When cutting high density polyethylene pipe, better known as HDPE pipe, these certain precautions always need to be taken. The pipe must be secured so that it does not roll or pinch. Position and support the pipe so that the pipe does not pinch the blade while you are cutting through it. If the pipe pinches the blade, do not force the blade out of the pipe. Reposition or support the pipe so that the cut opens up. Always stand uphill of the pipe in case it rolls. Never forget that if you are approached by anyone while the chainsaw is running, Engage the chain brake and shut off the engine. Fusing equipment is used at all AEG construction sites. Their purpose is to bond pieces of pipe together. This can be done as a linear bonding or for the combining of intersecting sections, such as a T connection. Fusing equipment operates by holding the HDPE pipe in place with clamps. While the pipe is held in place, a facer plate shaves the ends of the pipe until they are even. Next, the heat plate is set between the pipes to melt the plastic. After a determined set time, the heat plate is removed and the two ends are brought together. Pressure is applied to the pipes until they cool. You must be aware that there are hazards when using this type of equipment. This includes pinch points and burns. Therefore, PPE is required while operating this equipment. The PPE includes, but is not limited to, safety glasses, gloves, and steel toe boots. The pinch points include the clamps that hold the pipe, the pipe itself, and the hydraulic pistons. You should also never touch a heat plate while it is on. Always pick it up by the handle and keep it away from others. And be sure to place it in its protective holder when it is not in the machine. Additional precautions should also be taken while loading and unloading pipe into the fusion machines. This is because clamps can fall into place, striking your hands. You must always be aware of where you have your hands placed. Another potential hazard is the action of the pipe rolling out of the clamps and striking you. To prevent this, ensure that the pipe is secured properly in the clamps. Always be prepared to move just in case the pipe does come out of the machine. There are other hazards present that could also cause injury to your hands. Be sure to keep your hands clear of the machine when operating the hydraulic controls. When the machine's hydraulic controls are working, numerous pinch points exist that could severely damage your hands. 
At times, we may need to take the machine apart to work in tight areas. Breaking down a fusion machine presents special hazards. These hazards include pinch points, cuts, and abrasion hazards, and the potential of heavy equipment parts dropping on your feet. You should always be on the lookout for these dangers and put yourself in a position that minimizes risk. Always wear a good construction designed glove and keep your hands away from pinch points. The machine should always be turned off while breaking it down and any hydraulic pressure should be drained off. The facer plates have very sharp blades and should only be carried by the handle. Be sure to watch where your feet are when moving the equipment. These parts are heavy and could cause serious damage if dropped on your foot. While there are unique hazards present when moving equipment into a trench, the actual work presents situations that could put your safety in jeopardy. Special precautions must be taken when fusing pipe in a trench. Air monitoring is required to ensure the atmosphere in the trench is not explosive and that the air is safe to breathe. High methane concentration, which can be found in trenches, could cause a fire. Always have a fire extinguisher nearby. And be sure to watch where your hands are at all times when working in a trench, especially when attaching the fusion machine to the pipe. A tight area to work in makes the chances of you putting your hands in the wrong place much greater. Always take the time to be aware of your surroundings and your body positioning. The use of a fire extinguisher in the hands of a trained adult can be a life and property saving tool. However, improper use can compound the problem, increasing risk of injury. Utilizing a fire extinguisher requires training on its proper use and maintenance. Fire extinguishers are divided into four categories based on the different types of fires that typically occur. All AEGL fire extinguishers should have an ABC rating on them and be inspected monthly. Employees can expect to find fire extinguishers in company trucks, company mobile equipment, work and office trailers, fuel containment areas, around portable generators, and near any flammable hazards. Each fire extinguisher has a numerical rating that serves as a guide for the amount of fire the extinguishers can handle. The higher the number, the more firefighting power. The numerical rating indicates the approximate square feet of fire it can extinguish. Use the PASS acronym to help remember how to operate the fire extinguisher. Pull, pull the pin at the top of the extinguisher. Aim, aim at the base of the fire, not the flames, you must extinguish the fuel. Squeeze, Squeeze the lever slowly. If the handle is released, the discharge will stop. Sweep. Use a sweeping motion, side to side, until the fire is completely out. Operate the extinguisher from a safe distance and then move towards the fire once it starts to diminish. Physical hazards include those that can cause exterior injuries, such as cuts and burns, and those that can cause interior damage, such as hearing loss, heat stress, and other illnesses. Due to the nature of our work, physical hazards exist at every AEGL job site and include the potential for being struck by heavy equipment, spreader bar, or GCL bars, caught in collapsed anchor trenches, exposure to excessive noise from operating equipment, and heat or cold stress from working outside, electrocution due to contact with overhead power lines, slips, trips, and falls from walking on uneven ground or liner, cuts and abrasions from razor knives, hand tools, and other sharp equipment, and exposure to adverse weather conditions, such as high winds, lightning, snow, and ice storms. Remember, the key to avoiding these hazards is preparation. This means always being aware of your surroundings and acting in the safest manner possible.
Some of the most common accidents at our projects are slips, trips, and falls. While these types of accidents don't appear significant, they account for approximately 20% of all disabling on-the-job injuries. Fortunately, they are easy to prevent if you stay alert. Always have an awareness of where you're walking, especially around mud, wet landfill liners, and other slippery surfaces. Avoid going near or having to walk through slippery surfaces if possible. Wear the proper shoes. Wear shoes that have a deep tread and provide good traction and are appropriate for the work environment. When walking on slippery surfaces, shorten your steps as you would on ice. Beware of slip hazards, like mud and wet surfaces, especially when stepping up onto heavy equipment. Watch for trip hazards. This includes power cords, pipes, tools, and uneven surfaces or terrain within the work area. Good housekeeping will help minimize these potential hazards. Keep your work area free of any waste materials. Other hazards found in a neglected work site are unattended electrical cords and pieces of liner cuttings. These situations are a safety problem waiting to happen. Don't let anyone have a slip, trip, or fall because of not cleaning up after yourself. The best practice is to pick up as you work. Keep your work trailer clean and free of clutter, especially the main walkways. Never carry equipment into a trench. Set the equipment down first, enter the trench, and then retrieve the equipment. Communicate hazards to on-site personnel. Establish and utilize a pathway which is most free of slip and trip hazards. Establish a walkway over the anchor trenches to prevent the workers from falling in or jumping the trench. And be alert and correct or report potential tripping hazards promptly. Slips, trips, hits, and falls don't have to occur if you follow these safety rules. Take the time to watch where you are going and avoid these hazards. Lifting anything can pose a hazard to your back. Just how serious the risk is depends on your personal strengths and weaknesses, the weight of the load, the shape or awkwardness of the load, and other factors. Before you lift anything, be sure it's not too heavy for you. If it is, get help or use a mechanical lifting device. Next, survey your intended route for hazards. Now you're ready to lift. When lifting objects, use the following proper lifting technique. Know the path of where the load is being moved. Move any hazards from the path. Stand close to the load. Center your body on firm footing. Keep your feet shoulder width apart to get the best footing possible. Bend at the knees, not at the waist. Keep both feet flat and knees flexed slightly. Tighten stomach muscles to offset the force of the load. Grasp the object at opposite corners. Lift with your legs instead of your back muscles. Keep your back upright and avoid twisting. Remember that pushing a load typically puts less stress on your back than pulling it. And most importantly, think before lifting. If the object is too heavy, get help. Driving a company vehicle may be the most dangerous activity any AEGL worker can perform. Across the United States, more workers die from accidents while driving company vehicles than die from falls, electrocutions, and all other occupational sources combined. AEGL recognizes this serious work hazard and wants you to be the safest driver you can be, both on and off the job. To operate any AEGL vehicle, you must have a valid driver's license and you are only permitted to operate vehicles for which you have the proper class identified on your license. You will then receive on-the-job instruction on the vehicle you will be operating. Be sure you understand how to perform an outside inspection of the vehicle, parking procedures, and other rules. Finally, you must adhere to defensive driving principles for all vehicle operations. The three elements of defensive driving are 
hazard recognition, setting up a defense, and acting in a timely manner. We'll discuss each one of these now. Hazard recognition. Recognize potentially hazardous driving situations by scanning the road ahead, looking left and right, then left again at intersections, and checking rearview mirrors. Defensive actions. As potential hazards are recognized, consider the possible defensive actions of braking, steering around, and sounding the horns, headlights, or other forms of communication. And timely action. Act to avoid recognized potential hazards by adjusting your speed to account for driving conditions, changing lanes, or taking alternate routes. Here are some of the universal safety rules that apply during vehicle operation. You must follow these rules at all times when driving company vehicles. Always inspect the vehicle you are operating prior to use. Look for any possible fluid leaks. Visually inspect the tires to be sure they are properly inflated. Notice the condition of the windshield and report any chips or cracks to your supervisor. Once inside the cab, take a look at the fuel gauge to be sure that you have enough gas for the job. Also, be sure to fill the tank if it's less than half full before returning the vehicle. Don't put your coworker in a bad situation by returning a vehicle with no fuel. Make sure you keep the cab and interior of the vehicle clean and organized. Remember that you are part of a team and we all need to do our part. Don't leave a mess for someone else to clean. Seat belts must be worn at all times by all passengers. There is probably no other safety device ever invented that has saved as many lives as the automobile seat belt. Use it. Obey all posted speed limit and traffic signs, particularly when on a project site. These signs provide information to help protect you and must be followed at all times. Always use the parking brake when stopping for extended periods, parking, or exiting the vehicle. If you are a passenger, never ride outside the cab or passenger area of a vehicle, such as on the tailgate or in the truck bed. For one, you can't wear a seatbelt in these areas. And two, if the vehicle has to make a sudden stop, you may be tossed off the vehicle and seriously injured. If you are the driver, never allow anyone to ride in anything other than a seat equipped with a seat belt. There is to be no cell phone use of any type, even with a hands-free device. This includes talking and making calls. And absolutely no texting can occur while driving a company vehicle. While it is imperative that we follow all safety guidelines when operating a vehicle, it is just as important that we understand the importance of safety outside of the vehicle. As part of the job site workforce, we must always be aware of our surroundings, and that includes movement of heavy equipment and construction traffic. Never approach a moving vehicle unless contact has been made and proper signaling has been exchanged. Always maintain a safe distance, a minimum of 30 feet from any vehicle or piece of equipment that is in motion. And be aware of the potential for the vehicle or equipment to move. This is especially true in situations of high noise levels or when ear protection is used. In these instances, you now have only your sight to rely on for any impending dangers. Therefore, always position yourself while working so that you can see the potential pathways of construction equipment. Remember, whether you're in the cab or outside of the cab, your responsibility to safety is equally important. When working alongside a road, AEG employees need to be particularly mindful of the dangers. Construction equipment and vehicles that we work around have limited fields of view. Therefore, we must make ourselves as visible as possible when working alongside the road. One way to accomplish this is by erecting high-vis barricades or cones along the roadside to warn drivers that workers are in the area. Another method to control traffic is to use personnel wearing high-vis clothing with signs. Remember, we should always communicate with the site supervisor to ensure that all operators know where the crews will be working. This is especially critical in traffic-related circumstances. When projects require the need to move heavy material or access areas that we couldn't otherwise reach, 
AEGL uses forklifts and man lifts. Both pieces of equipment, however, can be very dangerous and even deadly if not operated properly. Never operate a forklift or man lift without the proper authorized training, which involves classroom learning and a hands-on demonstration where you are to show your ability to safely operate the equipment. Let's talk about some of the hazards associated with each piece of equipment. Forklifts, sometimes referred to as powered industrial trucks, are mobile, powered trucks used to carry, push, pull, lift, or stack material. Remember, they are not an automobile and cannot be operated by just anyone. You must be properly trained on the forklift before using it. Forklifts and aerial lifts may only be operated by employees who have received certified training on fork and aerial lifts. All training certificates must be on the operator at all times. All equipment operators are responsible for the safe operation of heavy equipment under their control. Operators are responsible for inspecting their equipment to ensure safe performance. Mandatory documented pre-shift inspection must be done by the equipment operator on each piece of equipment he operates. All heavy equipment on the job site is required to have a working backup alarm. If it is not working, do not operate the equipment. All equipment operators are required to wear seat belts during operation. Do not lift loads over other personnel, vehicles, or other heavy equipment. Always use a spotter in limited areas and when backing up. Remove your hands from the controls when people approach your equipment. The act of accidentally hitting or moving a control has injured and even killed workers. Inspect all rigging, such as shackles, bridles, slings, straps, and chains for wear, bending, or weakness before any usage. Always know the chart capacity of what your equipment can lift. Make sure you have a lift plan in place before lifting any load. Equipment should never be operated closer than 10 feet from power lines. For higher voltage power lines, a larger clearance is required. Operators must comply with the state-specific requirements where the job site is located. For example, in Arizona, water truck operators need to go to a dust control compliance training and all contractors need to purchase a dust control permit yearly. Man lifts are used to lift people to work in elevated areas. As with forklifts, they have specific requirements and hazards. Man lifts, like forklifts, cannot be operated without proper documented training. Working around heavy equipment can be dangerous because of the power and size of the equipment, the limited field of vision, and the noise levels that can be produced by the equipment. Heavy equipment at a worksite may include a variety of forklifts, wheel loaders, bobcats, water trucks, aerial lifts, and track excavators. To ensure the safety of all personnel in the work areas, the following safety procedures regarding heavy equipment must be reviewed prior to and followed during work activities. No riding on vehicles or equipment on anything other than fixed seats will take place. This includes the truck beds, buckets, or forks on heavy equipment. Ensure that the equipment operators are trained or experienced in the operation of the site-specific equipment. Personnel should never approach a piece of heavy equipment or enter the exclusion zone without the operator's acknowledgement, meaning, at minimum, making eye contact with the operator or the stoppage of work or yielding to the employee. The exclusion zone is a vicinity of approximately 30 feet around the piece of equipment in use. Always maintain visual contact with the operator when in the close proximity to the heavy equipment. Never walk under a load of a bucket, spreader bar, or forks. Walk between the fork boom and main cab of the power industrial forklift, or stand beside an open truck bed. Do not touch any of the straps or chains used for the rigging of the spreader bar once it is under load. Never approach equipment from the rear, and never walk behind heavy equipment. 
Wear hearing protection while on or around heavy equipment when normal conversation cannot be heard above work operations. As the operator of heavy equipment, you must perform a walk around inspection before using the equipment. To ensure your safety, it is required that the review and comments be documented on the heavy equipment inspection checklist. The checklist will include the following items. Check that all your mirrors are in place and clean. Ensure that your backup alarm is working. These points are extremely important. You are under no circumstances allowed to operate the machine without a working backup alarm and mirrors. Always wear your seat belt. The parking brake must be applied before you exit the machine and never leave the cab of the machine while it is parked on a slope. All workers need to assess their location when working around heavy equipment. In other words, you need to have situational awareness. Do not place yourself between the machine and anything that you could be pinned against. This could be another piece of equipment, materials, or even a mound of dirt. Keep eye contact with the operator and have a plan in mind to maneuver out of the way in case something goes wrong. Never, ever walk behind the machine while it is operating. Very often, AEG uses excavators to lift objects. Whenever we are lifting objects, you never want to use your hands to hold on to the object. Always use a tagline. This is a rope that is six feet long or more and is attached to the item being lifted. The tagline helps you to maneuver the object from a safe distance. When lifting an object with the excavator, we never want to attach straps or lines to the teeth of the bucket. The acceptable practice is to attach a clevis and lifting hook to the eyelet on the bucket. It should go without saying that you should not, under any circumstances, walk under a suspended load. When working around articulating dump trucks, there are rules put in place to keep you safe. Approach the machine from the front so that you can make direct eye contact with the driver. Never stand next to the dump body when the machine is being loaded. Rocks and dirt could potentially fall out of the dump body and hit you. When a loaded dump truck is moving towards you, back away as much as you need to give the machine a wide berth. Rocks and dirt have been known to fall out of the machine and hit workers that are standing or working nearby. And never walk behind a dump truck. One form of communication that is extremely important to know and understand is hand signals. Hand signals are used for communicating to other workers, such as between an equipment operator and a signal man, sometimes called a ground man. Before we get into the specific hand signals that are used, there are some ground rules that you must know regarding hand signals and working around operating equipment. One signal man. There should only be one signaler for each piece of equipment or equipment operator. More than one signal man can lead to confusion and potentially a serious accident. Signal slowly and deliberately. The signal man should clearly indicate the hand signals to the equipment operator and should not quickly change or revise the signals unless absolutely necessary. A wrong motion or action to the equipment operator is extremely dangerous and could cause an accident. Obey the signals. The equipment operator and all others in the area must obey the signal man unless doing so would cause an accident. Ensure a clear view. The signal man must be in clear view of the operator and of the workers in the area. The signal man should always remove any gloves that are being worn so that his signals can be more easily seen. It is important for you to recognize our hand signals so you will be able to know what the signal man is indicating. You will not be asked to be a signal person until you have been properly trained. Here are some of the common hand signals we use on our projects. Raise the boom, thumb pointing up. Lower the boom, thumb pointing down. Move slowly, pointed figure of one hand circling under other hand. Lower load, finger pointing down and circling. 
Hoist load, finger pointing up and circling. Stop, one arm extended and circling. Emergency stop, both arms extended and circling. Trenching or excavating into soil is a task we perform often. Digging a trench or excavating correctly requires experience and training. As a new employee to AEG, you need to understand the hazards associated with trenching and excavations and the precautions that both you and your crew need to implement to work safely. The two main hazards associated with working in a trench are cave-ins and hazardous atmospheres. Cave-ins can be prevented with proper benching and sloping of the soil. If needed, more sophisticated protection can be used, like trench boxes and shoring. A properly benched trench will look something like a stairway or stadium bleachers. Slope trenches will have a more gradual slope to the sides. At times on AEG job sites, some trenches will not be sloped or have benching. This is done with trenches that no one will enter. The pipe will be laid in the trench without anyone needing to be in the trench. The second primary hazard is unsafe atmospheres in a trench. When you enter a trench, always make certain that you or one of your co-workers in the trench is wearing their foregas meter. Ensure that the foregas meter is operating correctly and has been calibrated correctly. This is your best protection from exposing yourself to flammable or toxic environments. Another important thing to remember is that you must always have a ladder in place within 25 feet of where you are working in a trench. Your supervisor will review these roles and precautions on site whenever trenching is performed. No employee will be permitted to work on any part of an electrical power circuit unless the person is protected against electric shock. This must be done by de-energizing the circuit and grounding it, or by determining that the circuit has been locked and tagged out. The regulation for electrical circuits and wiring are as follows. All electrical circuits must be grounded according to NEC and NESC code. Ground fault circuit interrupters must be used in absence of properly grounded circuitry or when portable tools must be used around wet areas. All electrical wiring and equipment must be intrinsically safe for the use in potentially explosive environments and atmosphere. What intrinsically safe means in this case is that the wiring or piece of equipment won't ignite flammable gases. All electrical wiring and equipment must be type listed by Underwriters Laboratories or Factory Mutual for the specific applications. All installations must comply with the National Electric Code and the National Electric Safety Code. And all live wiring or equipment must be guarded to protect all persons or objects from harm. Electrical and extension cords are a very useful tool on any job site. However, when not used safely, they have the potential to cause serious injury. The following guidelines must be followed to make the use of extension cords as safe as possible. Inspect extension cords and hand tool cords for signs of wear every time you use them. If the outer insulation has a hole or cut in it, do not use it. Remember, Never use damaged extension cords and always replace them with an undamaged cord. When you discover a damaged extension cord, you must attach a tag to the cord stating out of service. This way, no other employee will use the cord and get hurt. Keep cords away from water and hot objects like the muffler of a generator. Avoid placing electrical cords across traffic areas. Ground fault circuit interrupters, or GFCIs, are required on all extension cords and equipment. GFCIs are usually found built into the generator. If a GFCI is not present on the generator, an external GFCI must be used. 
Always use heavy-duty three-prong extension cords for tools with three-prong plugs. Never remove or bend back the third prong. Make sure your tools are turned off before connecting them to an extension cord. When disconnecting the cord, pull the plug rather than the cord itself. Unplug and put away extension cords that are not being used. Cords are removed from service if the outer insulation has been damaged to the point that the interior wires are visible. To remove a cord from service, attach a tag that states, Out of service, do not use. At many job sites, generators are the only source of power that we may have to operate our tools. This may require them to run during the entire workday. Because of this, the generators may need to be refueled many times over through the course of a day. While we may be anxious to keep the workflow moving, we can't lose sight of the fact that refueling a generator must be done deliberately and cautiously. Remember, we're working with gasoline, which is a highly flammable and combustible liquid. Rushing to refuel may result in serious injury. Always follow the guidelines when working with generators and fuel. Never fill a generator while it is running. Turn the generator off and allow it to cool for five minutes. As it cools, take the time to inspect the generator for any damage, leaks, or spills. Be sure that you are wearing the proper PPE, such as eye protection and gloves. Take your time when adding fuel. Be careful not to spill any fuel on the ground or on the generator itself. If the fuel is spilled, Clean the generator or area properly. If the ground is saturated with fuel, the generator should be moved from the area before restarting. Never fill a generator on the liner. Should any spills occur, the fuel can damage the liner. Have the proper fire extinguisher on hand, meaning within 25 feet, in the event that a spark ignites a fire when restarting. Alert any co-workers that may be in the area to keep a safe distance from the generator upon restart. Another essential component to the generator is the GFCI, or Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter. All generators on construction sites must have GFCIs on the 110 outlets. Most generators manufactured today have these built in. However, generators that don't have this feature require that an external GFCI be used. An external GFCI plugs into the generator and then the power tool is plugged into the GFCI. Lifting rolls of liner, lifting pipe, lifting generators and other portable heavy tools are all activities that require rigging. At most AEGL job sites, rigging and lifting is an everyday occurrence. The term rigging refers to anything that is used to move heavy objects, such as straps, cables, and other related equipment. And with the moving of heavy objects comes the risk for injury. To maintain the highest level of safety whenever heavy lifting is required, precautions are necessary to prevent harm to personnel, equipment, materials, or the environment. Only properly trained and authorized AEGL employees are allowed to use rigging equipment to unload and move materials. Operators must ensure lifting equipment is properly inspected, tested, utilized, and maintained. Working loads on rigging must not exceed the safe limits established by the manufacturer. All field operations must maintain and adhere to a well-planned program of inspections to be certain that all equipment being used is within the required tolerance. An initial inspection must be performed at the time the equipment arrives on the project site. New synthetic slings, chokers, wire rope slings or bridles, and chains for use on the project do not require a proof test, but they must be tagged. The tag must contain information on the size, length, and rated vertical capacity of the slings or chains. All manufacturer shackles and hooks must have visible size and tonnage stamped on them. 
Employees using rigging equipment are responsible for inspecting their equipment prior to and during use. Only competent persons should perform the inspections. A competent person is defined by OSHA as one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees, and who has authorization to take prompt, corrective measures to eliminate them. The inspections must be documented on the proper inspection sheets that are available in the AEGL Health and Safety Plan under Rigging and Hoisting. All records must be kept in the folder or binder in case of an audit by the company safety director or OSHA. The following items are to be checked during inspection. Please refer to your rigging and hoisting plan for hazards to look for on each item and proper storage. Any equipment found to be defective is to be immediately tagged out, removed from service, and destroyed. Wire rope slings, chain slings, synthetic slings, end fittings, shackles, hooks. While inspections may seem like a tedious chore, it is an essential part of our safety plan. Taking just a few minutes to be certain that your gear is in proper working order can save you and your coworkers from serious injury. Due to the unique work that is performed by AEGL and the size and weight of the materials that are used, there is the potential for certain hazards that are considered exceptional to rigging situations. However, while these hazards are rare, it is important to understand them and always be aware of them. This is extremely important, not only when working with rigging, but when working around rigging as well. Situational awareness and recognizing the potential for danger are two of the main components of a personal safety program. Understand that there is risk involved with each work activity and that you should always be keeping a close eye on what's going on around you. The simple act of being aware and alert to possible dangers can mean the difference between life and death. In many circumstances, the environment itself can put you and your crew at risk. These hazards can come in different forms, each one having its own element of danger. Some environmentally related threats can affect you directly, such as wind and lightning. Others can take on a more subtle approach, such as exposure to extreme temperatures. Any of these circumstances could not only put you at risk for injury, but can jeopardize your health as well. Therefore, it is imperative that you recognize and understand the potential for danger while in the environment, both directly and indirectly. Wind can put you at risk in a variety of ways. The wind itself can carry particles of dust and sand that can get into your eyes, ears, nose, and throat. Exposure to wind can also cause damage to your skin, a condition known as windburn. The force of the wind also impacts your work. When working with large, flexible materials, such as a liner, wind can become especially dangerous. The liner can react just like a sail on a boat by capturing the force of the wind. As you can imagine, this could have devastating results. Depending on the strength of the wind, the liner can be actually ripped from your hands. It is imperative that you understand the proper way to react in windy conditions. Be aware of the situation. Notice how the wind is traveling and work from an angle that has the least resistance. Visualize how the wind will affect the work at hand. Drop the liner when necessary. If you feel the liner being picked up by the wind, don't fight it, just let go. The force is too great to manage. Many injuries have been sustained by trying to maneuver the liner in windy conditions. Lower the boom, literally. When working with deployment equipment, lower the boom if wind gusts begin to lift the liner. Stay upwind from the liner. Think about it. You don't want to be in the direction of the liner should the wind begin to carry it. Keep wind direction in mind when positioning yourself. Sandbag it. 
use sandbags to hold the liner in place until weather conditions stabilize. And always know your next move. Anticipate what will happen if the wind catches the liner. Then decide what the safest course of action would be. Rain, dew, or any form of wetness can cause many job site hazards. Limited vision, slippery conditions, and risk of electrical shock are just a few of the challenges that dampness creates. When working in inclement weather, sound judgment must be used to stay safe. Recognize the signs. Be aware of bad weather indicators, such as quick changes in humidity, dark clouds, and gusty winds. Thunder is a sure sign that trouble is brewing. The earlier that you can take precautions, the better. Throw the switch. Never use electrical equipment of any kind in rainy or damp conditions. Power down any and all electrical equipment that is in operation. Any electrical cords should be unplugged and gathered. Remember, a frayed cord in use during wet conditions could result in electrocution. Any cord that appears to be damaged should be removed from the work area and marked for inspection. Keep your footing. The potential for slips and falls are extremely high in wet or rain conditions when working around liners. Take slow and deliberate steps and avoid walking on any sloped terrain. Maintaining sure footing in a rain situation is another reason to only wear work boots that have the proper amount of tread. Lightning strikes. If lightning is observed or heard in the area, the work must stop immediately and the crew must regroup under shelter. Designated safe areas will be determined and identified in the tailgate meeting. If you have any questions about where to report in the event of an electrical storm, ask your supervisor. Or even better, voice your concerns during the tailgate meeting. Someone may have the same question and speaking up may keep someone else from injury.